Oh, thank you. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's nice to have kind of an excuse to come down to Santa Ana and to see the Bowers because this is a really special museum and I always forget how beautiful even the space and the galleries are and the collection that's here. Uh, so thank you for inviting me and I look forward to talking with you guys today. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. If, if you can't, for some reason I start mumbling really quietly, just let me know and I'll speak up. So Buddhist art is vast. It's, it's so many different things that come together. And I was thinking about how to approach uh, this talk about Buddhist Art 101, and I'm really going to just lay the foundations of what I perceive the most important parts of understanding Buddhist art to be. And that doesn't focus on Buddhist art uh, in one particular part of Asia, but just as a whole, so that as you guys leave uh, today and look forward to exploring more what interests you about Buddhist art. So if it's the tankas that are here, if it's other aspects of it, then you have kind of that foundation. And so that's how I've approached it uh, in my talk. And I'm going to keep my eye on the time to make sure that I keep you guys for about an hour. You aren't suffering away from the sun for too long. Uh, I just have this image. This is what I think of when I think of Buddhist art. I think of uh, shiny golden Buddha images that look out at you as you walk into a serene space that is filled with imagery. And it's almost so much imagery that it's hard to take in the amount of things that have to do with Buddhist uh, belief or practice. And that it's visually appealing, but it has so many meanings that lay beneath the surface. And it's once you start kind of unpacking those meanings and the stories that are embedded in the art themselves, uh, that you really start to get a clear idea of what Buddhist art is. And so this is uh, the inside of a, a temple building in uh, Bangkok, Thailand, uh, just to kind of give you an idea. So it's very, very different from, say, what you would see uh, in, in other temples in other parts of Asia. And so I starting with this quote, Buddhism, which began with the life of one man, Siddhartha Gautama, and his austere emphasis on personal discipline and personal growth, remains uh, the one complex of images and ideas that unites the Asian world. As it spread from India throughout Asia, Buddhism was adapted to different cultures, evolved into various practice traditions, uh, and expanded to include celestial Buddhas, savior bodhisattvas, and a marvelous assemblage of teachers and protectors. And so it starts with one man, and we're going to start kind of with him and his story and what his purpose was and why this historical personage of Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, uh, is so important for our understanding of Buddhist art and how this one man then gives rise to all of these different things and all of these different visions of what makes Buddhist art so special and so diverse. And so as you look at uh, the images on the screen, all of these different things count as Buddhist art. So they have the Buddha images uh, that we think of, but we also have little tiny votive images that are so much a part of going to a sacred place and taking it home with you so that you can continue in your belief and practice and honor the Buddha. There are buildings that are memorials to the Buddha, even symbols that don't have uh, anthropomorphic forms in them hark back to these same ideas. And so this, again, I could have put thousands of images in this one slide. They all would be uh, Buddhist art. Uh, and so it's just once you start scratching the surface, there's just so much that you can see uh, and, and reveal as what is Buddhist. And so you see, of course, a tanka uh, is under here as well. Uh, I think that's something that we all commonly think of in addition to the Buddha images are these fantastic paintings. And so the ones here at the Bowers are really wonderful examples of that. So we talk about how Buddhist art and Buddhism as a religion starts in India and it spreads across Asia. And it's one of the things so many Asian cultures have in common that even if they aren't even uh, active practicing Buddhist uh, cultures today, that at some point in their history, Buddhism was practiced there. And so the Buddha himself, and I'll talk about this in detail in a minute, uh, is living uh, in this general area. Uh, and then as he 
converts and spreads his teachings to others. They then move throughout Asia. And so often Buddhist scholars uh, and people who learn about Buddhist art and Buddhist uh, traditions talk about the way that the, the religion has spread. It either spread south into Southeast Asia through the subcontinent of India, or it, um, I'm just gonna move that over, uh, or it spreads out across the Himalaya or over through the desert into East Asia, and it takes different forms as you go. And so I'm not gonna get caught up in the details of when it all spreads, how it's different in different places, but really the connecting factors that you can see in all of the places where Buddhism is practiced. And so I think the fundamentals of understanding Buddhist art, you have to think about the fact that Buddhism comes from India. We might think of Buddhism in Tibet, Japan, China, Korea, I'm not gonna list all the places where it's practiced, and it, it takes on local adaptations and local interpretations. But at its heart, it is an Indian uh, religion, which means that it has an Indian point of view. Uh, one of the most fundamental aspects of Buddhism is the belief in the cycle of life and death, the cycle of rebirth, right? That we don't have one life, and time does not travel in a straight line uh, in this worldview, but in fact is a circle. And so you might think, well, that's why we see so many circles in, 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 in all of these aspects of Buddhist art, and you wouldn't be wrong. But the idea that we might have already lived hundreds, if not thousands, of lives before we got to this point. And we are stuck in this cycle. And in the Buddhist perspective, that you actually want to break that cycle because while you're in the, the cycle of life and death, the cycle of samsara, you're suffering. And it's only when you figure out how to break life, uh, death, and, and rebirth that you finally succeed uh, in, in gaining what, of course, is enlightenment. And so I'm not going to uh, kind of define all this stuff as we go. I'm kind of planting the seeds as we talk about Buddhist art. But this is very fundamental. And, of course, it's different from other uh, religions that you might see around the world, right? Uh, the Judeo-Christian perspective doesn't talk about life and, and rebirth uh, and the cycle of time in the same way. And the other thing that we see coming out of India that's so fundamental for Buddhism is what I'm calling and what is typically called the karmic system of rebirth in that, right, we all know the word karma, uh, that our actions very much can affect our future births and that uh, we make good actions and we will receive good um, uh, benefits in the future if we do bad things, there's going to be bad. Uh, benefit is the opposite of what we would get, right? That these bad things will happen to us if we do bad actions. Uh, and that, again, is, is something that you see it coming out of India and spreading with Buddhism into other parts of Asia. Uh, so karma is what we typically think of it as. And it, the, what we're doing when we're creating good actions is we're creating merit or demerit. So that's another word you might hear me say. Um, the central component, of course, is the historical Buddha, this guy I was just talking about, uh, Siddhartha Gautama. You'll also see him referred to as Shakyamuni. Uh, and so when you first start learning about uh, Buddhist art and Buddhism, learning his story is important uh, because what he did and what he taught becomes the foundation for everything that comes after that in Buddhism. And so I will talk about that. And then, of course, it informs a lot of Buddhist art that you see in different parts of Asia as well. Also important are the 547 previous lives of the Buddha. These are called jatakas, and I will bring them up again, and I'll have that word again. Uh, and knowing that his life as Siddhartha Gautama was his final life. He actually gains enlightenment. He breaks that cycle of life and death that I'm talking about. But he, upon uh, reaching this knowledge, remembered 547 previous lives and taught people about them because we learn from these lives how he perfected himself to be able to gain enlightenment and be the enlightened one, the Buddha. Uh, and so we see jatakas then represented in Buddhist art as well. 
Uh, and so knowing that detail is also important. That doesn't mean you have to memorize 548 stories, but knowing that these are there and that you'll see them often in Buddhist art is important. Four beliefs of Buddhism include the possibility that um, you can break this cycle of life and death by focusing the mind, uh, following the middle path, and not giving into the temptation of evil. And so focus the mind, right? Meditation. We were just hearing about how there are meditation activities here at the Bowers. We often associate meditation with Buddhism and with Buddhist monks. Mindfulness, which has become so uh, predominant even in our society, ties back into Buddhism. It's the idea that when you have a clear mind, you're open to the possibilities of, of uh, enlightenment. And it's through meditation that we can get rid of that monkey brain that's always right running around Right. I imagine you guys have monkey brains running around right now. Um, and so that also becomes important. We think of monks as, as people who master meditation. And that's important. The middle path means not going to one extreme or the other. And of course, the very obvious one, uh, the roots of evil, grief, ha greed, hatred, and delusion are bad. Buddhism at its core has what are called the three gems. And I actually have an image of those. They are the Buddha. The Dharma, uh, which are the texts or teachings, and that's actually uh, a Buddhist text. Uh, books in this part of Asia actually look quite different from the books uh, that we think of in their bound kind of capacity. These are actually palm leaf manuscripts uh, that would have originally held the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, and then also the Sangha, which is the monks. And Buddhists, at the beginning of ceremonies, when they walk into a Buddhist space, take refuge in these three things. And so everywhere that you see Buddhism spreading in Asia, you'll see these three things. Without the Buddha, uh, the Dharma, or the Sangha, you don't really have Buddhism. And of course, you can dispute that if you'd like, but that's a really good foundation for understanding what you're looking at um, when you look at Buddhist art. And so interpretation of the, Buddhists, uh, the Buddhist teachings change after he dies, and we'll see Buddhism change very quickly. Uh, if you're familiar with Buddhism at all as it spreads in Asia, is that it really does change from place to place, and it's that flexibility of his teaching that's important, uh, that you don't have to think just this way to achieve what he's talking about, but actually you can do it in any number of ways. And so after he dies, his religion really blossoms. And then over time, we actually get a development of this pantheon almost, of enlightened beings, of uh, divine beings or semi-divine beings that get incorporated into Buddhism. And that's when it gets really kind of complex. Uh, and there's a lot of different figures that you can memorize and learn about and focus on. And those are the figures that you see in the Tonkas. Right? And they take on varying degrees of importance. But I'm going to start with the life story of the Buddha, uh, just because I think that that's an important thing to start with. We have this prince. He is born uh, in a, a kingdom at the foothills of the Himalaya, right? uh, in what is now uh, the country of Nepal. And so his father is a king of this little uh, kingdom. And in the stories, he's actually born out of the side of his mother. But that's, why is that the case? Well, it's to tell you that this is not a normal person, right? That he's special. He's different from the rest of us. It creates this awe of mystery around him. And you'll see it represented in images of the Buddha and images of his life story over and over again. So it's hard to see here he's actually coming out of his mother's side. But you can see his mom holds on to a tree while she's doing it, uh, giving birth to him. This is uh, after she's given birth, the Buddha walks away. He, in his first seven footsteps, there's seven lotus blossoms. Uh, and so he's very special from the start. Uh, and, and his father goes to somebody who can see the future, like a soothsayer, and is told that his, this son of his will either be a great religious leader or a great king. His father tries to, you can imagine which one he chooses, right? Uh, his father tries to seclude him from the world so he doesn't have to be tempted by the, the religious wanderers outside because this is 
uh, a very uh, religious part of the world. Uh, you have a lot of um, ascetics and, 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 and followers of Hinduism searching for truth and enlightenment. And so uh, in his first 27 years of life, Siddhartha is kept in a palace and given everything he could ever want. Uh, right, he's spoiled rotten with riches. And you'd think he would be satisfied with that. And I think he is for many years, but he gets curious about what lays outside of the palace. And so he convinced his, uh, his driver, basically, uh, his charioteer, to drive him outside into the village, uh, outside of the, king, or of the palace. And in, immediately he sees four things that catch his curiosity. And these are called the four sights of, of the Buddha. Uh, he sees uh, uh, an old man. He sees a sick man. He sees a dead man, and he sees an ascetic, right? Somebody who's given up the material world and is wandering in search of spiritual truth. And he had never seen anything like that, right? He would get everything, everything that he wanted, he had been given, so he didn't know suffering existed in the world. He didn't realize all of the pain that comes with living, and he couldn't stop fixating on it. And seeing the ascetic, the fourth big sight of his is important because he decides that he's going to give up everything and he's going to seek answers to why does everybody suffer in this way. And so he has to leave the palace. He has to leave everything behind that he had been given. So you can see his father's attempts to keep him in the palace as a great king fail. And he says goodbye to his wife and child. He flees from the palace in the middle of the night on a horse. And in representations, you'll actually see uh, divine beings holding up the horse's hooves as he flees because he needs to escape. And horse's hooves are loud. And so these divine beings help him to escape so he can begin his quest. He gets rid of all of his material goods. He had long, luscious hair. He cuts it off. He wraps himself in, in the rags of an ascetic and, and starts his quest. And he goes to extremes. He follows uh, different teachers uh, and realizes that he sets out on his own and that starving himself for days and, and doing these quests that he's told to do aren't going to give him the answers he wants. And so he settles down beneath a tree that's called a Bodhi tree, and he meditates. And he finally realizes the truth. And at this moment, he touches the earth and calls it to witness this moment. And it's at that time that he gains enlightenment. And what does that mean? It means that he has this bliss. Uh, that he has the answers of the world and he can see uh, the way to escape the cycle of suffering, of life and death. Uh, and this is a very important occasion. And so he sits under a very specific tree called a Bodhi tree. You'll see that it actually has these beautiful heart-shaped leaves. Uh, and you'll see that because this is the tree, and maybe you guys are, are linguists, you'll realize that Bodhi and Buddha are very similar sounding because they are actually the same word. Uh, they are uh, about enlightenment. Uh, and so this is kind of the tree of enlightenment that he sits underneath. And so you will often find these not just represented in Buddhist art, but also uh, at Buddhist monasteries where they can survive. And once he escapes the cycle of life and death through this enlightenment, right, he becomes really very different from all of us. And he meets up with five ascetics he had been training with, and they can see immediately that he has changed. And they want to learn how he was able to do that, how he was able to gain enlightenment. And so he sits with them in a, a park with deer. So it's called a deer park, D-E-E-R, like the things that hop around and you have to not hit with your car. Um, and he sits with them and he tells them, right, through his first great teaching about what he has learned and how they too can follow his path, the middle path, and, and, and gain enlightenment as well. And so you'll see this moment represented in art. You'll see the deer in the deer park. You will see the five um, ascetics listening to him, right? And this is called the setting of the wheel of dharma, and again, dharma is the teachings, into motion. 
And so this becomes, right, these are all things that we can visualize, but over time, Indian and other, as it spreads, Asian artists figure out how to visualize these things. And so they actually take his concept or this concept of the wheel of teachings, the wheel of the law, quite literally. And when you see wheels like this, they look like kind of like a wagon wheel in Buddhist art, that's symbolizing his teachings. Many other miracles happen uh, over his years, and uh, he is, uh, uh, um, he continues to teach and, and be uh, a monk as he wanders uh, and converts other monks uh, for, I don't know how long he dies when he's in his 80s. Um, and so he has, we have all this documentation of these miracles uh, that he had done. For instance, on the left, we'll often see um, the Buddha being given food by an elephant and a monkey. And that's because uh, during uh, the 10th rainy season after he gained enlightenment, uh, he actually spent the whole uh, several months of this retreat apart from the other monks because they were fighting amongst themselves and he didn't want to have any part of it. Uh, and so he stays in the forest and an elephant and a monkey uh, help him with his needs. Uh, they, they kind of help him so that he can survive and they can also learn from him because it's not just humans that can learn from the Buddha, but all sentient beings, right? Uh, and so this is a reminder of that and his compassion for all beings as well. On the right, he actually, went, another time he goes up to heaven, which is where his mother is because she passed away shortly after he, do, uh, he was born. Uh, and preaches to her so she too can learn the Dharma. And so we learn again of his, of course, normal people can't ascend to heaven at will and then come back down to earth. And so this is a really exciting moment in Buddhist history. Uh, and so we often see represented one of the miracles of the Buddha's life is where he descends back to earth uh, and everybody rejoices that he's come back from heaven. Eventually, though, he does pass away, uh, and this is called his Pari Nirvana, and this is a very important occasion because this is when he ceases to exist. He has escaped the cycle of life and death, and the things that remain then are his teachings and the memory of him and the texts and, of course, the monks. Because how does this spread? It spreads through the monks. Who is able to read and write the texts? It's the monks, right? And so they are considered to be kind of an important part of uh, his memory and his relic almost is, is through those other things. And so, of course, this one's really easy to pick, pick out uh, when you're looking at Buddhist art and you see the Buddha laying down. Sometimes he might be sleeping, but most of the time you can assume uh, it is his death scene He'll usually be surrounded by other beings, monks, uh, celestial beings or divine beings, animals. Everybody is mourning his passing. Uh, and that's what you see. So here you see, right, like an image from Burma. Here you see an image from Japan. Uh, very different parts of Asia, very different ways of representing it in terms of the style, but still the same kind of image where you see him laying down uh, giving in to uh, death and everybody mourning the loss. And I just think this is such a special image uh, that you can really see how everybody is mourning and the amount of detail that the artist went into to show how momentous this occasion is, right? Even though it's wonderful that he was able to gain enlightenment, wonderful that he was able to give us all of this, it's still a very sad moment for everybody who's left behind. And knowing that story is important because as Buddhist art develops and spreads, we actually see the locations where these things happen become uh, the first important locations for Buddhist art uh, and practice, and they become pilgrimage sites. And so they're all in this part of uh, India where you have his enlightenment. You can still go there today. It's a very sacred place for Buddhists. It's called Bodh Gaya. Uh, and so we can still go visit the places where these things happened. And something that happens after his death is that uh, p humans by nature just want to focus their attention on things and honor things and look at things, right? And you don't want to have an abyss because your mind can't focus on nothingness unless it's very well trained. And so uh, he was cremated and his remains are divided 
initially into eight to go to these, these locations, and over time, much, much more, and placed into buildings that are called, or kind of uh, monuments that are called stupas. And so I'm not sure if you're familiar with that word. It's, it's S-T-U-P-A. Um, a stupa is a site of pilgrimage, of devotion and worship, uh, and it becomes this form that you see throughout the Buddhist world. It contains the relics of the historical Buddha initially, uh, and so these mounds get bigger and bigger as they get uh, more and more elaborate, as more and more people donate money to their care. Um, and they also get art placed around them. So as a pilgrim, you go, excuse me, to this site, and you go to honor the Buddha and learn from him. Uh, and what you do is you walk up to it and you circumambulate around it in a circle. Uh, you do it three times. The number three, right, the triple gems, uh, you'll hear over and over and over again in, in Buddhist practice. Um, and you do it three times tied to the triple gems. And you learn about his life because art gets placed around the stupa. And so the Buddha actually said, circumambulation will produce five rewards, right? The, the person will gain a good complexion in his next life. His voice will be fine. He may be reborn in heaven. He may be reborn into families of lords and nobles. He may gain nirvana. What causes the good complexion? It is his rejoicing in seeing the Buddha. What causes the fine voice? It is his reciting the sutra, and sutras are the texts, while circumambulating. What causes the rebirth in heaven? It is his will and intentional faithfulness to the precepts while circumambulating. What causes rebirth into aristocratic families? It is his act of honoring the feet of the Buddha with bowed head and face. What causes the attainment of nirvana? It is the accumulation of good karma. And yes, this I put this in to give you a sense of what the texts kind of read like and how every action has its kind of um, benefit. And so if you go through all of these things, right, he's mapping out how you too uh, can gain enlightenment, how you too can benefit from the actions of honoring him. And stupas change quite a bit depending on where you are. They get called pagodas when you move into East Asia. They're golden and enormous in Southeast Asia. Um, they're made out of wood. They're made out of different things. They can be painted in colors and wrapped in cloth. But they all go back to this original kind of moment of the Buddha's death and the spreading of his, his ashes. And, of course, stupas over time um, uh, don't just hold the relics of the Buddha. They will hold the relics of great kings who are Buddhist. They will hold the relics of powerful monks. Uh, and they will hold the triple gems, right? They will hold the texts as a kind of relic of the Buddha. And so they can hold many different things, but they're made in memory. And they're made to give us a chance to honor these things. And again, to gain enlightenment ourselves. And you can even see, right, how, so it's the circumambulation on the outside here. You can't enter into a stupa. It's like a mound. Uh, it changes in East Asia so that you might be able to walk into it, but it's still what you do when you go to a stupa as you walk around it. It goes back to what I was just showing you guys. Stupas can be quite small. You can have them as a votive. You can have them as... Um, something that you place on an altar, but they all, you know, so, and they look different depending on the time and the place, but you start to see this form and you start to understand what you're looking at. And so this is a stupa from, I think, the third century uh, in India or Pakistan. Uh, this is a later stupa, also from India. And then you can see here is a painting. You see the figure in the painting. It's a Tibetan painting. Uh, and what is behind that figure? It is a stupa. And so you can see how this image itself gets replicated and is an important one to start recognizing uh, as you decipher Buddhist art. Um, I'm going to skip that slide. So as I was saying that you can start to read the art by understanding the fundamental kind of um, foundations of, of what is being portrayed. And all of these images are the Buddha Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha. And after he dies, uh, his image doesn't develop in art 
really that quickly, but once it develops, you start to look for signs, uh, iconography that tell you that all of these different images are of the Buddha. He has different things uh, that even if he's painted, if he's cast in metal, if he's carved out of wood, if he's made out of clay, the things that you look for when you look for the Buddha. And you guys might recognize these. I'm just going to show you them really quickly. It's what we call the iconography of the Buddha, right? And it's to set him apart. It's to say, look, again, he's born out of his mother's side. We know he's special. How do we show that to people, right? Art is always about communicating not necessarily verbal things, right, in visual form. Uh, enlightenment is very abstract. It's very difficult to explain. How do we convey that through art? And that's what makes Buddhist art so wonderful. And this is what we see developing. Uh, his head is not shaped like a normal person's head. It's got a, what I call a cranial bump on it, right? That's not a bun. He didn't just take his hair and pile it on top. He actually has this extra bump on his head. It's called an ushnisha. Uh, and these words are Sanskrit because that's the, wor that's the language, uh, that's the core of what Buddhist texts are. Uh, it symbolizes wisdom and spiritual, uh, spirituality and shows that he has gained enlightenment. Uh, so right, extra wisdom, where is that going to fit? Well, his head is special, and he's got a cranial bump for that. Uh, and then you'll see that his hair doesn't look like normal hair. Most of the time when you see images of the historical Buddha, his hair is actually in these soft snail shell curls, and they even point to the right uh, in a uh, clockwise fashion. Um, and so his hair is very special. It's said that when he cuts his hair off as he flees the palace, it just turns in that direction. So again, special. Uh, he's got a whirl of hair in between his eyes. People often refer to that as a third eye. It's not. And in fact, if you've ever seen a third eye, like Shiva, the Hindu deity, has a third eye, it looks like an eye, right? It's usually, a, what is that, vertical uh, eye. This doesn't look like an eye, so it's not. Um, it's actually a whirl of hair, and it's um, symbolizing spiritual insight. And you don't always see this on the Buddha, but just so you guys know that that's something that you often see. You will also see elongated earlobes, right? His ears are long. You, that is actually from him taking off all of the gold jewelry that his father had covered him with, right? If you wear gold jewelry for 20 years on your ears, they're going to stretch. And if you give that up to seek spiritual enlightenment, which we're all thankful the Buddha did, then you're going to have those long ears. And so it's a reminder of the material things that he gave up. Uh, you'll also see he's always, always, always dressed in a monk's robe because even though he's a p spiritually perfect being, uh, he is a monk. Uh, what's the first thing he does when he leaves the palace after he gives everything up? He dresses himself in basically a monk's robe, scraps of cloth. And so you look for that. Uh, and then another thing that's really neat about the Buddha is he's always holding his hands. Uh, he's always holding his hands some way, right? He's always doing something. And that is a... Uh, like a visual language, a language that comes through the hands. It's called a mudra. It's something that, again, is Indian. So you'll see this in other Indic, uh, lang uh, in Indic uh, religions, and you'll see it, for instance, in Hindu art as well. Uh, so this it's a symbolic hand gesture, and uh, he's holding his hands to tell us things. He's telling us that he is teaching. He's telling us that we are welcome to come worship. Right? And so the Buddha, in texts that talk about the Buddha, that describe him, there are actually, I think, 32 different physical characteristics that he has that are different from everybody else. That bump on his head, the Ushnisha, is one of them. He actually has flat feet. That's one of them. He's uh, got really long toes and fingers that are webbed. It's really interesting kind of characteristics if you go back and read these texts. But over time, we'll see um, artists incorporating these, char these 32 uh, physical characteristics into uh, their depictions of the Buddha to show his spiritual perfection. And we'll see those 32 marks get carried into other sacred beings that become important in Buddhism as well. 
Uh, what are other things? Yeah, all the hairs on his head point to the right. That's one of his special characteristics. Another one is that his shoulders are gently curved. Another one is that his torso is like a lion. His arms reach to the knees while standing. His skin is golden. Uh, he has cheeks like a lion. His teeth have no gaps, and they are very white. Um, he has a long tongue that can reach the ears. Again, so it's really detailed. I think that his nose... I can't, his nose is like a parrot's beak, right? So all of these different things describe this kind of perfect being uh, so that, oh yeah, he even has 40 teeth instead of 32. So it's really fascinating the amount of detail that goes in. So you're not going to go up to a Buddha image and like count the teeth, but you just know that all of these details are there and it helps you to identify that the Buddha is there. Um, I'm not going to go over the mudras with you guys. Again, it's something that you might want to read about or perhaps you already know. Um, he, for instance, will hold his hands in this fashion in which he looks like he's going like this. So that's his first sermon at the deer park at Sarnath. And so you can see how having all these different things that you know fold back in, oops, fold back in on themselves. Um, and you start to read all of these different things, right? And so that's why I kind of was starting with the, the basic moments. Another one that you'll often see, he will touch the earth with his right hand, and the other hand will be folded into his lap, as in meditation. He'll be seated. That's his moment of enlightenment. And in, for instance, in Thailand, I think 90 or more percent of all the Buddha images are that moment. Uh, and so reading all of that can tell us what's being depicted, right? So every time a Buddha is holding his hands, every time his hands are placed every way, it's communicating things. And so these images are just filled with all of this information. Um, and you can see some artists took the 32 uh, characteristics more literally than others, um, right? But here you see him touching the ground. That's his moment of enlightenment. <clears throat> right, and that 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 those characteristics again translate into painted and sculptural forms. And once you learn them, then you can start see why. Right, you can start to determine when you see a plethora of Buddhist imagery immediately. You know which one's the Buddha. Right, looking at the screen, which there's an image on your right and an image on your left. They have several things in common. Only one of them is the Buddha or a Buddha. Which one is it? Exactly, right? And so you're using uh, language, but it's just not a, a verbal or written language to read. You're reading these images uh, with the knowledge that you've been giving. So this is a, an enlightened monk, and you can see he's wearing a monk's robe. This is the Buddha. You can see all, obviously, you guys are reading it, so you, I don't have to outline it for you. Um, and then, of course, he gets set into the different scenes. I put this one. Isn't that great? You can see what we're looking at here is his birth. Right here's his mother holding onto the tree. So this is an image from Nepal. I showed you an image from Cambodia. Right over time, uh, you can start to see that they all choose the same kind of way of depicting it that gets developed in India. Here's the Buddha coming out of her side. Here are the lotuses that symbolize his first steps. Um, and here you see his hand gesture. Right, that's the Dharma Chakra Mudra. Uh, where, and so we know, even if we didn't see all the people surrounding him, learning from him, that that's his first sermon. Uh, gosh, I can't remember which one that one is because I'm looking at it from such a strange angle. Um, so that's kind of my spiel on the historical Buddha. i got to speed up because I'm running out of time already. Um, the other thing I want to mention is the Jatakas, which are his previous lives. And I said there's 547, but really there's only 10 that are important. And the reason that they're important is because the final 10 lives of the Buddha is where he perfects himself. And each one he perfects himself by doing something very specific and, and, and highlighting the 10 virtues. So does it matter to us as people learning about how to be good uh, Buddhists, whether he actually did this, etc.? Or are we learning the morality of these actions so that we too can try to be better people? 
And so in each of them, he does things. He's a renunciant, right? He renunciates material things. And the next one, he shows extreme courage. These are all the best characteristics that we as people can use to be good to others and to be more perfect people. And uh, another one, he's incredibly devoted uh, to his family and, and to the people around him. Another one, he's very resolute. He is going to accomplish something, and he accomplishes it no matter what comes in his path. Uh, another one, the Mahasada Jataka, is wisdom, perseverance, forbearance, equanimity, uh, truthfulness, and the final one is charity. And so really quickly, uh, they're very extreme stories that don't say copy the Buddha in this Jataka. Here's one that's very popular. It's called the Mahasattva Jataka. And let me just guess if, and ask you if you can figure out. Uh, so these are two uh, different time periods, two different locations, illustrating the same story. The Buddha is not the Buddha yet. It's a previous life. He's out with his brothers in the forest and the mountains, and they come across this hungry tigress, right? A tiger mom. Um, and she's there with her cubs, and she's so hungry she can't feed her children. And uh, and he's just not sure what to do. His brothers go to get help because they want to help this hungry tigress. And then uh, Mahasattva, which is his name, uh, figures out what he's going to do. He offers himself to her so she can save herself and her cubs. Except he lays there and she's so hungry, she can't do anything, right? She's so weak with hunger. So what does he do? He... he uh, he decides that he's going to jump off the cliff and sacrifice himself for her, making it easier, right, uh, uh, so that she is able to consume him and then feed her, her, tiger, her little baby tigers. Uh, does that mean that everybody should go out and, and, and jump off a cliff so that hungry animals have food? Or is it about the selflessness and the charity and the giving, right, that it takes? to be able to do those actions. And that's what the Jatakas are. And so each one of these shows that kind of extreme action so that you can take that in for yourself uh, and, and interpret it, right? Here he gives away every single thing that he owns. He's born and he says, what can I give away? Uh, he gives away his elephant. He's a prince, so he's got a lot to give away. He gets kicked out of the kingdom because he gives away so many precious things. Then he gives away his children. Then he gives away his wife. He has nothing. And then they all come back to him and everybody rejoices, right? And that's his very last life before he's born as the Buddha. It's the extreme version of charity or generosity. Over time, what happens is Buddhism splits into two. We have Theravada, uh, which is the Buddhism that's called the Way of the Elders. It's what's practiced in Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka. Speaking of Sri Lanka, I don't know if you guys know, there is a fantastic uh, exhibition of Sri Lankan art at LACMA right now. Uh, and it's very rare to see this uh, place get highlighted and really focused on. So if you're interested in that, uh, definitely go to LACMA. But uh, Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia uh, are followers of Theravada, which means that what I just showed you is pretty much of the bulk of their art. They look at the historical Buddha as this person who had perfected himself over time, uh, and that is the way that they too can gain enlightenment. Uh, it's seen as a slow kind of progression, uh, a slow path. The ideal path is to be able to be a monk, uh, and gain enlightenment in that way. Uh, and so it's very kind of narrow in scope compared to some of the other types of Buddhism that we see uh, developing in other parts of Asia. Uh, over, what we see happening next is that um, there were disagreements about this. Many monks thought this was too limiting, and they think that it was too literal in the interpretation of what the Buddha taught. And so they came up and developed a different path called the Great Path, Mahayana. And that's the bulk of what you see uh, when you see Buddhist art and when you see Buddhist kind of practice across Asia uh, is Mahayana. The Mahayana doctrine uh, says that we all have Buddha nature inside of us, which means that we all have the possibility of gaining enlightenment pretty much at any time if we can focus our minds, right? And that 
uh, that there's a universal liberation that can happen uh, from suffering for all sentient beings, not just people, not just monks, right? But everybody can escape suffering. Uh, and so there's this existence of many Buddhas, and then we get the development of um, beings called bodhisattvas uh, that help everybody to gain enlightenment. And so Mahayana people look to Buddhas that reside in different heavens. They look to compassionate beings called bodhisattvas. And you see this whole spectrum of enlightened beings and wise beings to help you discover your own Buddha nature and gain enlightenment. Right? And so it's much more this kind of universal grand uh, uh, depiction and idea. And you see a much more complex approach to Buddhism and Buddhists start developing. So that's what, for instance, the Tonkas and the Tibetan paintings uh, are rooted in that tradition. Uh, then the third one that kind of comes off of Mahayana is called Vajrayana Buddhism. Uh, it's very esoteric. And to really understand it, you have to have a teacher. Um, and, and they pull from very specific kinds of texts called tantras. Uh, and it's from a very specific time period. But again, that's the Buddhism that's practiced in Tibet. So for instance, at the Pacific Asia Museum yesterday, we had Tibetan monks that had created a sand mandala. And then they have, what do, what do Tibetan monks do with sand mandalas? They just mix it all. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's immaculate. It's colorful. And it's made out of sand. Then they just wipe it all together in a ceremony. And they remind us of impermanence, right? And as they're creating the ceremony, they're, they're, they're reading and chanting esoteric texts. Um, and so you get infinite numbers of Buddhas. And you'll start to have to learn all of the iconography that that entails. Uh, there's five central Buddhas that you'll often see uh, represented uh, in Mahayana art. Each one is associated with a different cardinal direction. And each one resides over a different heaven or a different pure land, right? Uh, in, in Himalayan uh, traditions, they're all, each one's a different color, and that helps you to recognize it. The only one that I tend to focus on is Amitabha or Amida uh, Buddha, who uh, presides over the Western Pure Land. He's very popular in East Asia. Uh, this is a Japanese image. You often recognize him because he's holding his hands in this meditative pose. He becomes very uh, popular because his Pure Land is this salvational land. If you dedicate your life to Amitabha or to any of these other Buddhas, you get reborn in their land and uh, get to learn the Dharma while having like everything you could ever need because it's basically a type of heaven that is filled with amazing smells and sounds and uh, trees and flowers and music and bodhisattvas, etc. That's what you're seeing here, right? And so you'll see people dedicating their lives not to the historical Buddha, uh, but to these other ones, and Amitabha is the most popular. So see, and this is that Mahayana Buddhism that says there's Buddhas everywhere and we all have Buddha nature in us. And so, uh, so I'm kind of brushing through it quickly, but just to give you a sense that once you have this kind of understanding, you can start to learn the more kind of details and start to learn about if you're interested in a Buddha that's not the historical Buddha, you can do that. Right? It's like, why is there just one historic Buddha? Uh, we think that there's Buddhas everywhere. We think there were Buddhas before the Buddha. We think there will be Buddhas after the Buddha. Right? And all of these beings that are perfect beings who gain enlightenment. And we can all learn from them. And we all have that possibility. And then the other kind of Buddhist um, being that I want to tell you about is called a bodhisattva. Again, rooted in that same word, Bodhi, right, is the name of the tree I told you guys about. Um, so these are both human and celestial beings that are like saviors. They achieve a perfect understanding of the universe, the same kinds of understanding we saw the historical Buddha achieve, but they don't choose nirvana and parinirvana and to cease to exist. Instead, they want to guide everybody else to enlightenment as well. So these are seen as the ultimate compassionate beings of the Buddhist kind of world. Um, and they don't look like Buddhas, but they kind of do, right? And we get this entire 
pantheon of different bodhisattvas. And so you can see what about them is like the Buddha. They have these perfect kind of bodies. They often usually have the long arms like the Buddha did. They often will have a cranial bump like the Buddha did. But what do they have? They have jewelry, right? They have luscious kind of clothing. They're not monks. They're not ascetics because they didn't give everything up because they are still tied to the earth because they are here to help us. And so uh, Manjushri is this guy. He's the Bodhisattva of wisdom. Uh, the other two are the same versions, or different versions of the same Bodhisattva, whose name is Avalokiteshvara, um, also known as Guanyin or Canon, depending on where you are in Asia. Uh, and he is the Bodhisattva of infinite compassion. So that's, that's not bad, right? <laughs> he's absolutely wonderful. And what we'll see with Avalokiteshvara uh, is that he's so overwhelmed with compassion that you'll see it uh, visualized uh, in this way, in that you'll see he has sometimes been given, um, what is this, 11 heads and 1,000 arms. Um, and it's because uh, he's so concerned, uh, he's vowed to never rest until everybody gains enlightenment, right? That he's freed all sentient beings from, from the cycle of life and death. He has such an infinite amount of compassion that he will suffer as long as any being on earth also suffers. Um, and so uh, he asks for and is given then... Um, all of these extra heads and arms so that he can do a better job of his task, basically. Uh, he realizes that with two arms and one head, he's never going to be able to accomplish that with the help of Amitabha, the Buddha I just introduced you to, who is uh, Avalokiteshvara's spiritual father. Uh, he's able to do this. And we're reminded of their connection because you usually see a Buddha head at the very top, and that Buddha is the Buddha Amitabha. And again, when you see these two kinds of beings next to each other, you can tell which one's a Buddha and which one's a Bodhisattva. Uh, the Buddha is the one on the, exactly, right? And so then you can see these are uh, similar, they're not the same material, but from, they're both Chinese uh, similar time period images. And you can see the, the attempts, right, at successfully of the artist to show we have the curly hair, and the Ushnisha, right, and the monk's robes. Here, just the simplicity of adding uh, crown and necklaces and, and a, a few other details, you know immediately you're dealing with two different beings. And that's because in Buddhist art, you often get an entire pantheon depicted together. And so it's nice to see usually at the center you're going to have a Buddha. It might be the historic Buddha. It might be a different Buddha. But he's going to be surrounded by monks and bodhisattvas and guardians, right? And so the bodhisattvas might not have a visible cranial bump because they still have their hair. They rarely have a shaved head because they're not monks. Uh, they're regular beings working in the world. Um, and so you start to see how once you get the foundation for seeing and reading these things, you get a better idea of what you're looking at. So that was a three-dimensional image. Uh, here you see um, it's not complete, but something that has survived from, I think, like the ninth century um, or earlier, where you have the Buddha at the center and then the same kind of pantheon of beings. And so he'll have enlightened monks, bodhisattvas, uh, and other beings surrounding him. Uh, mandalas build from these same ideas. Uh, the way that they work is... Uh, they're kind of, they look structural, right? They're like a kind of palace. Oops, I'm too close to the microphone, sorry. Um, where you'll have a being at the center who is who you are dedicated to as a Buddhist. You focus on Avalokiteshvara or Manjushri or Amitabha or Shakyamuni. Uh, and through meditation and concentration, right, you want to reach their realm. And by reaching their realm, you're reaching a higher plane of existence. Uh, and enlightenment. And so these are visual tools to help you get there. Uh, and so you'll see at the center there's always some deity or some being. Uh, and so you're visualizing 
how to get to that place. And it's that meditation and concentration uh, in a visual form. And it's usually in Tibet, for sure, you get a whole variety of beings on the outside that are also related either to the being on the inside. Again, that's Manjushri here. Uh, or uh, they're related to him, or they're uh, helpful beings, or they're the beings you want to transcend. So is that it? <laughs> now we're all experts in Buddhist art? <laughs> There's no way, right, to even simplify it more than what I've already done uh, and have any idea of how to approach this stuff. And so one of the difficult things about Buddhist art, right, is that it does have this entire world embedded in it that you have to read, and, and it can be intimidating if you're not sure what you're looking at. And so there's narratives and stories, there's enlightened beings, there's, there's also uh, dangerous, ferocious beings who are out to distract you from enlightenment. Uh, there's monks who have dedicated themselves to uh, the teachings of the Buddha, right? There's all of these different things, and that doesn't even come into the, the architecture and all of this stuff. Uh, and so it's really kind of, you know, getting the tools to keep learning. And to know that if you don't know exactly what you're looking at or you're not sure, that it even changes from place to place. So you look at Buddhist art in Korea, and it's going to be different from uh, Buddhist art even in Japan, where there's such a shared history there, right? Uh, we can even trace the Japanese uh, development of Buddhism to Korean artists and Korean texts. Um, but it doesn't stay the same because it adapts, because Buddhism has that flexibility and that there's always stories, right, and examples of, of how to live your life as a good Buddhist and what's going to happen to you if you don't. And so you'll get images of heaven, you'll get images of hell, and everything in between. Uh, and so this is one of my favorites. This is um, one page of a manuscript uh, of the Lotus Sutra from Korea. It's actually uh, around the 14th century. And you can see it's just a magnificent image, but it's filled with all of these different beings. You can tell the Buddha, you can tell the Bodhisattvas usually have crowns, you can tell the monks because they usually have shaved heads and no jewelry, but no cranial bump. They all have halos. Uh, and you can see as you move across this page how much there is uh, to learn. So you get uh, a preaching scene uh, in which uh, you get uh, the Buddha surrounded by Bodhisattvas, and earthly kings, um, <coughs> and he's preaching to his disciples, right? You see where that is? Then you move along, um, and you get what I love. It's called the parable of the burning house. So can you guys see that? It's uh, zoomed in in great detail. You get, do you guys see these crazy figures running around? as if their house is on fire, because their house is on fire. Um, and basically, a father promises animal-drawn carts to his child to tempt him away from poisonous insects, snakes, and the burning house. Once outside, the child is rewarded with a grand carriage. And in that story, it's not a very good story, is it? Dad says, hey, I'll give you this if you leave the burning house and away from these dangerous things. Uh, but in that story, right, it's a parable. The father is the Buddha. The uh, child is the sentient beings. That's us. And the burning house, the poisonous snakes, and all of those other dangerous things, right, are the perils of the mortal world. And so the Buddha, or uh, the father, right, says if you leave these dangerous things, you will be rewarded. And so you keep going in Buddhist art and you get all of these different things coming together. And so what looks like crazy people running around a burning house, right, uh, turns into a way of seeing what the Buddha is teaching us. And so it can be as simple as you want it to be and it can be as complex as you want it to be. But the joy of it is is kind of keeping uh, with it and learning as you read these images and moving along, right? And, 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 and that's what I think is so wonderful about Buddhist art. And that's what I enjoy uh, about talking about it, 
uh, about teaching about it and about kind of creating art uh, um, exhibitions about it uh, as well. So uh, I hope that's not you know, like a jumble of things to you guys. Uh, that's pretty much all the time I have. I'm, of course, happy to take some questions as we go. Or you can come up and talk to me afterwards. I know it's really nice outside. Uh, and so uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and, and, and that's all I've got for you today. <laughs>